Joe Partavilla. Thanks for taking the time from your busy day to check out the latest episode of the Forbes Books Podcast. Everybody who goes into business wants to make money, but you also want to do some good. It's the old doing well by doing good concept. But how do you know you're doing well or doing good? Joining me this week are Maggie Miller and Hannah Noakes, the founders of social impact consulting firm Magnify Impact and the authors of the upcoming Forbes book, Magnify Your Impact, Powering Profit with Purpose. Hey there, Maggie. Hi, good to be with you, Joe. Thanks for having us. Oh, thank you. And welcome to the podcast, Hannah. Hi, Joe. Hello. So Maggie, Magnify is a social impact consulting firm. And in 2020, it was sort of like the year that companies embraced social impact. But you guys were way ahead of the curve. When did you and Hannah decide to launch this firm? So Hannah and I were both working on our own social impact consultancies back in 2017, and we came together in 2018 to share some project work together, fell in love with one another's working styles. I think we complement one another very much so in, in, in how we approach projects and our vision orientation. And so we decided that we would create Magnify together in 2018. And Hannah, like I mentioned, you know, 2020 became top of mind for a lot of companies and, and the media. But why did you feel in 2018 this kind of company could succeed and would succeed? Well, at the time, I was working for a major corporation in Austin, Texas, and just kind of looking around me in the in the community, I saw that there were only a handful of companies here in Austin that had a dedicated corporate social responsibility or social impact person on staff. And I thought, you know, that's interesting because this is the way of the world and the way that companies are headed. So I thought it would be great to be able to help lots of companies have access to the same best-in-class strategic approach to social impact that major corporations have. And Maggie, it almost seems like it's your old-fashioned entrepreneur find a problem, fix a problem. Why do you think people were so slow to incorporate a lot of these elements into their companies back in, you know, 17, 18? Well, yeah, I wanted to address that. You said something about 2020 being the year that people were paying attention to social impact. And I think that 2020 was a, a year where people had to necessarily take these pauses and people were in dire situations due to the pandemic. And so social impact arose at that point in terms of how can we help people get through the situation. But in fact, I would say that before that, 2018, 2019, business really started changing when Larry Fink from BlackRock started writing a call to the letter of his investor group saying, hey, we need to look at business as an investment in our stakeholder system, not just our shareholders. And the definition of business started changing in that moment where the business roundtable, 180 CEOs came together that same year and said, let's redefine business as working towards the good of our stakeholder system and not just shareholders. Hmm. And Hannah, I don't know if you're a big fan of basketball, but Michael Jordan back in the 80s was skewered in the media because he didn't have a stand on any kind of political issues. And the famous quote that has become legendary by this point is that, you know, Republicans buy sneakers too. So there was always this sort of thinking by corporate America uh, or even, you know, people who just run regular businesses is like, I don't want to get involved. Mm -hmm. Why do you think now, Maggie mentioned the Larry Finks of the world, but why do you think over the last few years we're seeing this change where companies are like, it's okay that we have an opinion on something other than what we do or, or produce. I think a lot of that is driven by the expectations of employees and consumers these days, particularly the younger generations. And those individuals are really demanding that the companies that they work for or do business with take a stand on social issues. So even the most reticent business leadership is starting to consider what is their position and how do they want to talk about it publicly. You see on one extreme, someone like Mark Benioff from Salesforce taking extreme stands or, you know, very vocal stands on issues 
That's a concept we typically hear referred to as CEO activism. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of CEOs or business leaders are nervous to take that kind of public stand. And we don't necessarily say that that's necessary, but you should consider what values do you operate by inside your organization and make sure that all of your actions are consistent with those values. The authenticity piece is really the most critical. That's the place to start. Mm -hmm. And Maggie, you know, I think if you are well-read or just understand the human condition, I think most people realize that there are a lot of problems in this country and this world, whether it's uh, systemic racism, the pandemic, whether it's sexual harassment in the offices, but there is this weird sector of this world that don't believe there's anything wrong with, with what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. So Maggie, how is, when you consult a company, how do you thread that needle that toes the line of like, that people who don't agree that there's anything wrong, but you're not going to put them off by, by, by providing some sort of social impact initiatives? The first thing I'd love to say is that we love working with people who want to actually address the social issues of the world. But if they're, you know, on a larger scale, companies now have to sort of follow suit to where business is going. Business is changing. And so each company must consider their high level footprint on the world. And that could be called their corporate responsibility their environmental social governance, which is referred to as ESG. And by nature of being a larger corporation, certainly a public corporation, but a growing company, you are going to start confronting those issues whether you want to or not. The more that investment money comes into a company, those considerations all come into play whether you want them to or not. So you will see, for example, the need to think about supply chain issues and supply chain governance of organizations. And those things cannot be ignored. So some people are being towed along because they have to by the nature of investment money and the growing corporation and their need to vocally uh, report on those things. And then other people have very forward-thinking leadership that wants to integrate the company's superpowers to make a difference around social issues. So you'll find people all over the continuum, but the fact is that it you really can't be ignored anymore. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that superpowers thing uh, later, but Hannah, you mentioned the generational thing, and there was that mm -hmm. Deloitte survey that came out that said 49% of Gen Z and 44% of millennials made choices on the type of work they are prepared to do or in an organization they'd work for based on personal ethics. So mm -hmm. how much of a shift is this because of the millennials and Gen Zs? No no offense to us uh, Gen Xers or boomers, but how big of it is the driving force that the next generation and the, and the generation after that are driving this change? It's a huge driving force. The millennial population is 75% of the employee base in the next couple of years and 40% of the consumer base globally. So in terms of purchasing power and talent, um, absolutely, it's a, it's a major consideration. And Maggie, talking about superpowers, if, if someone's listening, they'll probably be like, wait, wait a minute, are we talking about the, the latest MCU movie? What's happening here? So what is a company's superpower? Yeah, so we love to use the term superpowers in our book. We dedicated an entire chapter around it. You know, we all grew up with these powers that we wish we had or or a character that we followed. So we use the same concepts for companies, and that means the product, the service, the expertise, what you're uniquely positioned to give to the world, what you're better at than anyone else or what you're trying to be better at than anyone else. And using that component to serve impact issues. So, you know, if you're if you are a technology company, how can you use that expertise to serve digital divide issues um, around technology and populations of poverty? And um, so we really advocate when we work with companies that we take a good look at their superpowers, their economic engine, what they're better at than anyone else, 
and that we serve social impact issues that way, that we serve communities and we try to transform the communities that they operate in by using those superpowers. And Hannah, you've said in the past that Warby Parker is one of those companies that use their superpower, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, they um, they were really revolutionary in how they used their supply chain and um, the ability to create low-cost eyeglasses just to create a revolutionary business model, but also their buy a pair, give a pair program really was a way to use they, what they do best, create high-quality, affordable eyeglasses and give them to those in the world that needed them most. Mm. And I'd love to also point out that superpowers don't just apply to companies. All of us individually have superpowers. We have gifts that make us unique, talents, skills, expertise, and resources. And I think that um, particularly in the last year, many of us have become inspired personally to solve some of the world's problems and might be searching for the best way to do that. And we love to work with individuals, both business leaders and just regular people that have a dream for some change they want to see in the world and help them activate how to make that happen. And Hannah, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that you guys have written a book called Magnify Your Impact. And in it, there's a chapter about blueprints and creating a formula that companies can use. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So, Joe, we wrote our book to provide a blueprint, which is a step-by-step process for business leaders to create an impact strategy that solves problems in the world, but also drives profitability back to their business. And that includes four steps. First is identifying your core ideology, your purpose, and your values. The second step is identifying your superpowers, product skills, expertise, knowledge, resources that you can bring to bear in a unique way. The third step is identifying your stakeholders, your employees, customers, local operating communities, suppliers, business partners that you can bring along with you to help you make the impact that you'd like to see in the world. And then lastly, it's narrowing your focus to impact pillars. What are the two or three areas where you are going to focus your efforts and your resources to go deeper, not wider, and make a really effective, long-lasting impact? And Maggie, what do you mean by that deeper, not wider? Well, because I think people all want to be like, oh my God, we got to reach the greatest amount of people possible. But what, 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 why focus in on being deeper as opposed to being wider? Yeah, well, part of the work that we really do with companies is to look at where they want to hone in on those focus areas. And the reason being is that we want them to use their resources in the greatest way possible to make the greatest effect to look at those objectives and say, how do we want to make a measurable difference in this community, with these people, in this social issue area? When you see a company being generous or having a generous social responsibility budget, everyone is going to request money or support. And what we want them to do is really hone in on those superpowers. What are they better at than anyone else in the world? Or what do they strive to be? better at than anyone else in the world? And how do they want to uniquely use that to focus their impact? And so that might look like child welfare and some objectives under child welfare. That might be veteran prosperity. That may be disaster response. And so we really want to hone in on the partnerships under those pillars, those focused areas of support, so that they can make a measurable difference in those areas. So Maggie, it sounds like you're taking a page from the Jim Collins book, Good to Great, when he talks about the hedgehog concept. I felt like there was a couple elements sprinkled into what Hannah was talking about there. Absolutely. So we use several exercises from Jim Collins in our book, and the hedgehog concept is certainly mentioned in there. You know, there's three components to that concept. What are you deeply passionate about? And so for us, that relates to that core ideology that Hannah previously mentioned, what is your legacy that you want to leave in the world? What is, what is the purpose of the company? What is the behavior set that drives the company? What can you be the best in the world at is the second circle. So again, what are your superpowers? What do you want to be better at than anyone else? 
and specifically for us, how do you want to utilize those things to deal with impact issues, to deal with the ills of the world, to help make a difference in the communities you work in? And then what drives your economic engine? We understand that companies want to be profitable, that companies exist also for that reason. So we never work with people and say, don't make money anymore. We're talking about a shared value concept here where a company can have a competitive advantage, make money, while at the same time uh, use those superpowers to serve the world. And a lot of these companies, Hannah, are, are making a big part of this, of their hiring process. If you did a quick LinkedIn search for social impact on LinkedIn for, in the United States, 28,000 jobs include the phrase social impact. So mm -hmm. it, it goes far beyond what the companies are doing, but it, it actually boils down to their hiring process as well. Well, on both sides, I think companies are hiring for roles that will help them expand and extend their social impact strategy, particularly in the last year, we've seen a huge uptick in the hiring for corporate social responsibility or ESG or social impact type roles. And then in terms of the talent, we're seeing that it is a major driver for whether an individual wants to come and work for your company. Companies are smart in their employment brand to talk about social impact as an important component of their culture. We just want to make sure that it's authentic, that there's actually action to back it up. What I would add to that that I think is really important when you talk about um, employment around corporate responsibility is the fact that this used to be a concept 15, 20 years ago that was a cubicle. You know, so there was someone in a cubicle maybe talking about if the t company had a good year, that they were going to write a check to a cause area. And those cubicles of marketing, of culture, of corporate citizenship, they've all converged at this point, if, for a lack of a better image. They, they've come together. They're one. And so you no longer can put it aside in a cubicle. It's very much integrated into how a company's culture unfolds and the cultural initiatives inside of a company and externally, how they want to communicate themselves as a corporate citizen. And Hannah, you mentioned authenticity. And, you know, when during the social uprising with the Black Lives Matter movement, you saw a lot of companies you know, splash banners, you know, Black Lives Matter, we support Black Lives Matter. And to me, it made me happy to see that. But like the pessimist in me was like, okay, so what are you doing about that? You know, other than hanging up a sign or putting a banner on your website. So what's your radar like? Are you able to tell when a company is really being authentic with their social impact or they're just trying to play along as to what mm -hmm. is acceptable? Yeah, that was a really challenging time for companies because there was a great expectation for companies to take some kind of a stand and make a response immediately. And then at the same time, consumers were really sniffing out the companies that just made a statement but didn't have any action to back it up or their previous practices were not in line with the statements that they were making. So when that happened, that was really a catalyst to drive companies to look at their actions and their policies to ensure that the words they were saying aligned with what they were actually doing inside their companies. And consumers and employees will do their research um, and they will sniff out whether your actions are in line with, with your talk. And so that authenticity is increasingly more important. And Maggie, when you meet with organizations that you're going to team up with, with Magnify, before we, we go, you know, what, what, what steps do you initially take with any of these firms that are looking to, you know, improve their social impact uh, footprint? Uh, is there something that you just do right away with folks? Or is it more of like when you get together with them, you just try to find as much information as you can about the, the, the company you're about to work with? Yeah, so I think we try to take a page out of our book as much as possible. So every company is somewhere different in that continuum of building an impact strategy. We have the honor of working with a lot of emerging companies, companies that are growing rapidly. And oftentimes they've started their process with a, a bunch of passionate employees who 
are really excited about cause areas because they're probably a young employee base. And so our process is really to get to know where the company is at in their process. Sometimes they don't have stated core ideology, purpose, and values because they grew too rapidly. Sometimes they have initiatives that they've started with young employee base, but they haven't strategically tied it to how to deepen relationships with their stakeholder system. So we really start with each company by finding out where they are at in the process in this continuum on our blueprint, as Hannah described before. And I think that's what's exciting about our work is every company, every industry is very different. What that blueprint looks like is very different. And Hannah, if folks want to get in touch with your team and find out more about Magnify, how would they do that? You can visit our website at magnify-impact.com or follow us on social at, at Magnify Impact. Our book is available for pre-order and that link is available on our website as well. Awesome. They are the founders of Magnify, Maggie Miller and Hannah Noakes. Maggie, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you, Joe, for having us today. And Hannah, it's always a pleasure chatting with you. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Joe. And that's it for this edition of the Forbes Books Podcast. If you enjoy the show, make sure you take a second to subscribe so you automatically get new shows when they drop. Also, if you have a minute, I'd love if you left us a review so more amazing entrepreneurs like yourself can discover the show. And please, don't forget the golden rule and treat others as you want to be treated. Thanks for listening. Until next time, adios. This has been a production of Forbes Books Radio. Find out more at ForbesBooksRadio.com.